We're glad all of you are here. If you have your Bibles with you, please open them to Hebrews. We'll be looking at a couple of different places there in just a couple of minutes. Just a reminder, for those of you that haven't had a chance to be with us on Wednesday nights, we're having our summer series. It's been going on the last couple of weeks, and we're following the theme of Project Love. We've heard a couple of good lessons already from um, um, Dave Phillips and um, Chris Altrock, and this week will be no exception. Uh, Noel Whitlock, the preacher at the College Church in Searcy, is going to be here. Uh, I have a little bit of a vested interest in this, a couple of things. Number one, Noel and I went to school together, as Avon Malone would say, way back in 1900, none of your business, at Oklahoma Christian. Um, and Noel's been doing a good work ever since he's been out. He was one of the, uh, the preacher boys, I guess, early on in some of those classes. And um, someone th that's at Pleasant Valley came up to me a few months ago and, and plopped down on my desk a sermon outline. I'm always kind of interested in those sorts of things. And they said, now, I got to hear this the other day at the college church, and I went and asked the preacher if he'd give me a copy of it, and he did. Uh, and I got to read it, and I don't know how it listens, but it reads fantastically well. And I asked Noel if he would be with us and, and deal with that very theme this summer, and that's what he's going to be talking about this Wednesday night as he deals with the subject, loving our families. All of us come from a family. All of us are part of families. That should be something that should have a great amount of relevance for your life and for mine. So we hope that you'll be with us this Wednesday night, 630, uh, to listen to our brother Noel uh, share a part of God's word with us. In Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15 that brother Bob read just a moment ago. The writer says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This is one of those truths that we have heard so many times that we run the risk of forgetting just how significant this is. And notice what it is that the writer is saying, that God became a man so that he could die. Many, many people in the world reject this notion because it seems too incredible to them. And it is a remarkable truth quite probably the most amazing thing that's ever happened in history. And what this means, well, it's about more than we can probably comprehend. I love the take that Frederick Beekner gives on it. He says, to anyone who's looking for good reasons for being a Christian, let me suggest the only good one I really know. What does the faith mean by taking this man who was really a man, perhaps the only man, and calling him the Son of God, the Word of God, the Christ, all these metaphors that are so alien to our way of thinking. What is the reality about him other than the reality of his manhood that these metaphors are so clumsily, hopelessly, beautifully trying to convey? Just this, I believe, and it is much, that in this man there is power to turn goats into tigers, to give life to the half alive, even to the dead. That what he asks of us when he says, follow me, is what he also has the power to give. And that this is the power of God that he has, that he is. And that is why men have called him the Christ. You know what that word means? It's not Jesus' last name, as a lot of folks ignorantly assume. Christ is a title. It means the anointed one, the Messiah. Anytime you see in the Bible the phrase Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, a theological statement is being made. The writer is saying two things essentially every time this appears. One, this is Jesus, 
born of Mary, who grew up in Nazareth, who was a carpenter. That's who he is. What he is, he's the Messiah. He's God's anointed one. Anytime you see that phrase, Jesus Christ, it means something very spectacular. And what it is that makes Jesus the Christ is that he brings redemption to those lost in sin. We live in a time when people like to talk about the example that Jesus set, and he set a tremendous one, or the teaching that he left behind, and certainly no one spoke like this man. But Jesus didn't come just to teach. He didn't come just to be an example. He came to die. He came to pay a price. He came to redeem sinners from their just recompense for their sins. And since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Jesus came for every last human being, every one. In order for Jesus to turn aside the wrath of God against guilty sinners, the Bible says that he had to be one with them and to die as a substitute for them. Listen to the Bible writer in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. It says here, For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with the sacrifice of sin by himself. Just as man is destined to die once and then to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This concept was so remarkable a truth that even in the early centuries of Christianity, a lot of people could not bear it. The Gnostics couldn't bear it because to the Gnostics, this idea of God becoming a sacrifice, well, it, it just seemed a little bit against the Greek philosophy that was the underpinning of their thinking. So instead of Jesus being a redeemer, Jesus instead was a type of revealer. He came to give you a secret initiation into certain truths. He came to give you a body of special teaching, of special knowledge, and then you would achieve enlightenment except that's not what the Bible writers say. They say Jesus came to die, to be a sacrifice. There was another heresy in the early centuries of Christendom called docetism. And the docetists basically believed that Jesus just appeared to be human. Really, he was God, but it only looked to his followers as if he was a person because God can't become a person after all. God is a spirit. So there was this body, or at least it looked like a body that he was inhabiting, but it wasn't really a body. Friends, you don't have to be very conversant in the New Testament to know that again and again and again, the Bible writers condemn this idea. Jesus was fully God, and Jesus was fully man. As difficult as that has been to accept, the Bible is unequivocal in its witness in stating such. But beyond the price of paying for our salvation, there's something else that's really quite remarkable about what Jesus did in taking on human form. Hebrews goes on to say that he had to become like us in order to perfectly understand us and identify with us. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Friends, this is stunning, that God would be so concerned about our plight that he would take on the form of one of us, that he would walk among us. Every time I think about that, that makes me dizzy. And yet the Bible does not back off one iota from such a claim. The country of Jordan is a poor, debt-ridden nation with many problems. They're bordering Israel, and they've always had a bit of a tenuous relationship with their neighbors. Many Jordanians for decades have long complained that no one's paying attention to their country's problems. And even though he was beloved by most of his people, the late King Hussein was sharply criticized for being too preoccupied with foreign policy during the last years of his reign. He was going and talking to his pal Saddam Hussein. He was hobnobbing with other heads of state and the people said, but he doesn't seem to care about us and he doesn't seem to care about our problems. The feeling in the streets of Amman was that the plight of the average citizen was generally ignored or misunderstood by their king. But upon Hussein's death, his son became king, Abdullah II. And since he took over, he has been showing all kinds of signs of trying to narrow this gap. He's posed as a taxi passenger, watching life unfold on the chaotic streets of his capital. He's disguised himself as a television reporter to inspect Jordan's free trade zone. He's investigated government hospitals to determine the way that patients there are treated. Abdullah has been making an attempt over the last several years of trying to step out beyond the trappings of royalty into the beat up clothes of an ordinary Jordanian in an attempt to understand more about their problems. Now it's not clear yet exactly what, if any effect, the Arab Spring is going to have on this man and this country. But so far, his attempts seem to have been winning over the people. Now if all of this sounds familiar, it should. The Bible reminds us that in Jesus, we have a king who knows what life is like from the other side of the throne. In Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. To understand what problems we face, Jesus became a man and lived through those problems. He knows what we face because he himself faced it. The Bible says that he has been tempted in every way just as we have been. It means what it says. It means that whatever it is that you're facing tonight, you have someone who is not just a friend, but who is a savior, who is a messiah, who is a king, but a king who's gotten out from the palace and lived among the people and faced the very same troubles that you face. Jesus know what it's like to be in a family and occasionally experience tension and conflict? He does. He had siblings. Jesus understand what it means to be in subjection to your parents? Yes. He had parents. Does Jesus know what it's like to bear a heavy financial burden with all of the family depending on you? 
More than likely, Joseph died early in Jesus' life. As the oldest son, the burden would have fallen on him to take care of his mother and his siblings. Does Jesus know what it's like to have a bunch of friends that one day seem like they're with you and the next day you can't count on them? You've read the gospel accounts, you know that. Does Jesus know what it's like to be misunderstood, to be unappreciated? Yeah. Does Jesus know what it's like to be tempted with alcohol, with sexual pleasure? Yeah. Tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So the next time you sit back and think, there's probably not anybody here in this church, there's probably not anyone here in this town that really knows what it is that I'm going through. You might be right about that, but Jesus knows and he cares. Why do you think the Bible says all of what it says about this point? If all Jesus had to do was to come and to save us, he could have come here, he could have died, and that would have been accomplished. But the reason he had to go through this is so when God is looking down at us, seeing how woeful we are in living the way he's called us to live, maybe as our advocate Jesus is saying, it's not quite as easy as it looks because I've been there and I've done it. He realizes how difficult it is to weather life storms because he himself faced them. Kipling writes about that rare individual who can walk with kings and not lose the common touch. Jesus is a king, but he has not lost the common touch. And his efforts are winning over many of the people. The only question that remains tonight are you one of those people? If not, his invitation is calling to you. Won't you answer as we stand and sing together?